Father, thank You so much for this day. Lord, I pray that You would please, Father, help me now. Father, You know my frame. You know my weakness. Father, please give me words to feed Your sheep, to show Christ to those who have yet to see Him. Please, Father, be with us now. I pray in Christ's beautiful name. Amen. We come this morning and in a few minutes this afternoon to the third part of a three-part series that I've called Biographical Sketches from 3 John. The book of 3 John is a tiny little book. It's right before Jude and then Revelation at the end of your Bible. And what John does in 3 John is he writes to his beloved spiritual son, Gaius. And he tells Gaius, he commends Gaius. We saw several weeks ago in the first message in this series that Gaius was a portrait of what it looks like to follow Christ, to be a hospitable Christian, just your average Christian in the pew, not the preacher behind the pulpit, not the missionary in the Middle East serving, but just the normal day-to-day Christian serving in the church. What does that look like? And we saw Gaius, a humble man who was hospitable, who was loving, who loved the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. And what was the result? The result of such a life was a man who became a fellow worker for the truth. He actually was a a worker alongside the apostles and the preachers and the missionaries for the gospel to advance in the world. And then last week we saw the second example that John gave us, that of Diotrephes. And that message I called a portrait of pride. Here we had a man within the church who is an arrogant man. His desire, John says, was that he wanted to be first. And we looked at the different manifestations of that pride in a man's heart. That certainly, how we ended last week, was with saying that is certainly a man we do not want to imitate. We heard a wonderful message from our brother this morning from Ephesians 5 for those who are here for the first Bible study hour on imitation. What does it mean to imitate? And what does it, who should we imitate? And our brother beautifully showed us that we are to imitate God and we are to imitate His Son, Jesus Christ, and how He is to live. And this message, providentially, is a perfect uh, follow-up to that to show us what it looks like to imitate Christians around us. And so today we will focus on verses 11 and 12 of 3 John chapter 1, the singular chapter of this letter. So why don't we read those two short verses? 3 John 1 11, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony and you know that our testimony is true. Demetrius, the third and final example that we see here in 3 John, and it's that of a good example. We will consider today the call to imitation, the fruit of regeneration, and the place of reputation. Those are our three points. If it's helpful for you, those are in the back of the bulletin uh, if you'd like to follow along with that or if you're taking notes. The call to imitation, the fruit of regeneration, and the place of reputation. So let's consider first the call to imitation. Look there at verse 11 and the opening words. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. This word is the word that Michael pointed out for us in Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. You know, if you go through your New Testament, you're going to see this concept and these same words for imitate all throughout the New Testament. We're told that the churches are to imitate the apostles. The apostle Paul tells the church, he says, imitate us, the men who've walked with Jesus Christ. 
twice the Apostle Paul tells the Christians to imitate himself. He's saying, I mean, have we heard the adage, do as I say, not as I do? Well, that is antithetical to what the Apostle Paul says the Christian should be. He looks at the churches and says, churches, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Once, Paul talks about being imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. You know, that's really, he's saying to one church, imitate that church over there. He talks about the noble Macedonians who in their poverty gave even more money. They didn't say, well, I'll give some money to the church because business has been good. No, in their poverty, they even gave more. And he tells the Corinthians, imitate that church. So we're told to imitate different people. In Hebrews, we're told to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We're given that beautiful chapter in Hebrews chapter 11 of all of the biograph- biographies of the men and women who've gone before us who by faith persevered to the end. You know, in Hebrews chapter 13, you're even told to imitate your church leaders. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The standard for who should be in formal church leadership is a high standard. And the reason is because they are to set an example to the flock of what Christianity looks like. And we'll see that it's not just the leader must be holy. No, the leader must be holy because he is a demonstration of what you must be as the members of the church. So what's my point? My point is that God makes it very plain in His Word that it is not only good to imitate others, but it is actually proper, it is expected, and it is commanded for us to imitate others around us who've gone before us in the faith. And so as we navigate the landscape of fellow Christians both past and present. That's what we're doing. Today, we're going to look back and look at the landscape of Christianity and we're going to zoom in on one particular Christian. And as we do this, as you go from here and do that in your own life and say, who should I imitate? You must be very careful and selective. Your standard for who you should imitate must not simply be, well, we kind of have a similar personality and they're a Christian, so I want to be like so-and-so. Why not? Why is it that we have to have a selective standard for who we imitate? Why is it that our standard should not just be, well, they profess the faith or they're in the church? Well, precisely because of who we saw last week in Diotrephes, a man in the church and very likely in leadership in the church. And John tells us, do not imitate Diotrephes. There are bad examples who ought not to be followed, so we must choose wisely who we imitate. And let me just say off the bat, I just want to commend to you several practical uh, helps as you determine, as you think in your life, who should I imitate? Who should I be like? Who should I desire to even follow in life? Let me say just several points here. I would say those who resemble Christ likeness in their practical day to day living. As you're looking amongst yourselves, you say, you ought to say, who is most resemblant of Jesus Christ day to day? Not who can speak the most theology, who can. Welcome. We're in... Paula's down here. We ought not to simply say, who, is, who can spout the most theology, who can memorize the most verses, but we ought to see who from day to day is living like Christ. Another one, which is a very practical, helpful tip, is who is asking the right questions in life. As you look around at your fellow Christians around you, you ought to strive to follow the example of not those who are asking the questions like, well, what's wrong with this? Try to show me a scripture verse why I can't do this or that. We ought to seek to imitate those who are saying, what is going to help me run faster? What's going to help me be more like Christ in my life? I put to you, as you look around at other Christians, do you see those whose lives convict you? Do you see those whose spiritual disciplines convict you? of your own lack of discipline or your own Christ-likeness, follow such examples. Those who consistently step outside of their comfort zone 
and would cause you to do the same. Not those who perfectly match your temperament, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually, but those who will cause you to step outside of your spiritual comfort zone and strive to be more like Christ. That's a lesson on imitation. Why do we even care about hearing about Demetrius? Why do we care to hear about Diotrephes and Gaius? Because in our life we are commanded to imitate others. Now it's interesting as we look at who John tells Gaius to imitate. Remember this letter is written to Gaius. For those of you who are here a couple of weeks ago, you remember what was said about Gaius we are not told much about Demetrius at all. We will do what we can this morning to look into his life, but really we have very little information. Those two verses I read to you, that's all we have about Demetrius. And in comparison, we had a great deal of information about Gaius. His service, his overall Christianity was exemplary. You know, when we looked at Gaius, and I love this, You know, John tells him, Gaius, I pray that your outer circumstances would go as well for you as your soul goes. I pray that your outer health would reflect the health of your soul. What an incredible thing to be said. And I asked you, think about yourself. If your... I've got this still on, don't I? If your inner soul the condition, the health of your soul was traded with your outer condition, would you be more beautiful? Would you be richer? Would you have more money? Or if your outer circumstances reflected the condition of your soul, would you be a beggar under the bridge? And I challenged us with that. It's a convicting thought. But John tells of Gaius, I pray that your outer circumstances would reflect the beauty you have within your soul. Now watch this. Gaius, someone we should imitate, John inferences, John tells him, in essence, you, Gaius, you exemplary Christian, imitate Demetrius. Be like this man. Look there in verse 12. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone. What a high commendation about a man of whom we know so little. Haven't you had this where you've admired someone greatly because someone else who you admire admires them? I had that with brother Tim Conway. I knew Tim Conway. I know Tim Conway very, very well. And before I had ever met Charles Leiter, I admired Charles Leiter. Why? Because of Tim's admiration and reverence for that man. Haven't you had that to be the case for you? And I feel like with Gaius, as I studied through this, and I hope it's for you, that when you heard of Gaius, you said, I like this guy, Gaius. This guy's the kind of man where you just get around him and you feel special. You feel valuable. He's going to take care of you. Whether you're a stranger, whether you're in his family, Gaius is going to love you. I love Gaius. Gaius. I look to Gaius. I admire Gaius. And John says, hey Gaius, be like Demetrius. My respect and admiration for Demetrius shoots through the roof when I see such a commendation given to such a godly man. Now, I will say as the last final word on this lesson on imitation, who we desire to be like is a reflection of our hearts. Have you ever asked yourself, why do I want to be like so-and-so? My father always used to ask me when I would make some sort of change in my life, whether it was a haircut or had a certain type of music I wanted to listen to, he'd he'd ask me, "Who, who are you trying to be like? And I never really understood the weight of that question. It was not until years later that I realize that the desire I have to imitate or follow reveals the condition of my own soul. In fact, it reveals who is and who is not a child of God. Look there in verse 11. Now catch this. This is important. And search your heart. Who do you desire to be like? John says this in verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. And he says this following. 
Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. The Christian, the Christian is one who's had the veil removed from their eyes to see the beauty of Jesus Christ. And as they see Christ, they want Christ and they run to Christ and they want to be around others who love Christ. You know, when we go witnessing and people say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe I have to go to church. And I say, well, there's no command that sits here and says, you must believe by faith and by going to church and you shall be saved. People want to say, well, I don't want this, this rule. I'm a Christian, but I have my own walk with Christ. I don't need a church. But guess what? The true Christian who's looking at Jesus wants to be like Christ and a desire to be with those who are like Christ. A desire to imitate those who are like Christ. And John says it here. Do not imitate evil. Imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Who you desire to be like reveals the condition of your soul. Children, who is it? that you desire to be like? Is your greatest desire to be like the pop star, to be like the sports figure? Or do you look at those who are reflecting Christ in their lives and desire them? It's a searching question. But that's John's lesson on imitation. I can tell you, as my father asked me that question, that for many years I pursued the wrong examples. Whether I was saved or not, I'm not quite sure the point of my conversion, but for many years, I strove after those who were of the world. I wanted to be like the sports figures. I wanted to be like those who had fame and fortune in this world, and it led me down a dangerous path which almost cost me my very soul. But by the grace of God, I stand where I stand today because of His mercy. But, my friends, think on those who you desire to imitate. It reveals your heart. It reveals your soul. Secondly, let's consider, and we'll spend a bit of time here, and it might take a bit of thinking on our part, but I want to look at point number two, the fruit of regeneration. This is very, very simple what John says. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. He makes a very simple statement about the new birth and gives us a lesson on regeneration. That's the Greek word which is used in Scripture to speak of the restoration of a thing to its pristine state. So it's a theological word, regeneration. But think of it like this. When somebody becomes a Christian, they are restored. They are made new. Their sinful heart with which they were born is taken away and destroyed and God gives a brand new heart. That's what Jesus speaks about, the new birth in John chapter 3. And here John gives us a very basic synopsis of what it means to be regenerated or born again. If you do good, you are from God. If you do evil, you are not from God. In fact, you've never even seen God. It's pretty simple, isn't it? We could go to Jesus' illustration to illuminate it. Jesus said, fruit doesn't come from a thorn bush, does it? Nor thorns from a fig tree. If your life is bearing thorns, you are a thorn bush. If your life is bearing fruit of righteousness, you are a fruit tree. Pretty black and white, plain and simple, short, sharp, and succinct. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Now, I want to go into this lesson on regeneration and show us the dimensions of what this new birth looks like. But before we begin there, we've got to realize something at the start. Every single person, despite what this world and its philosophy tells you, is not born a beautiful fruit tree. You are born a thorn bush. Do you see the spiritual analogy I'm making? As a human, you are born a sinner. 
depraved. Every facet of your being has been corrupted by sin. What I do not mean by that is every single child born is as evil and wicked as they possibly could be. What I mean is every component of the human heart is affected by sin. Your mind, the way you think, is affected by sin. You are innately selfish in your desires. Your flesh is naturally sinful. I can prove it to you on the playground. I see a lot of parents here this morning. Raise your hand, please, if you had to teach your child how to be mean and selfish on the playground. You had to teach your child how to say please and thank you and not push little Betty down the slide, right? Because naturally, the person wants themselves and they want what's good for them. That is the natural born condition into which everyone is born. We are born sinners. We start out, as Romans 3 tells us, not able to do good. The condition that the Bible tells men that we are in is not, yes, you're born with a sin nature and you're, you, you are born not good, but at any point you can choose and be good. The Bible tells us all have turned aside. They cannot do good. No man seeks for God. That is the condition in which we begin this life. We're not bad. Now listen to this. We are not bad because we do bad. We do bad because we are bad. Do you see it? Now you say, well, what's the big deal? It has everything to do. People say, who do they say? This is a good guy. This is a bad guy. When? Once he's done something bad, right? We don't become bad because of our actions. Our actions are fruit from a bad root. We are bad, therefore we do bad. It is the basis from which we begin. So for us to do good, for us to do... John says here, whoever does good is from God. Well, how in the world can we do good? We've got to have a radical change in our very nature for this to be a possibility. And this radical transformation is what Scripture calls regeneration. It's the new birth. And John gives us a very basic lesson. Now, in order for us to feel the full weight of verse 11, I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 3. Just a couple pages over, likely, in your Bible. To 1 John chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 4 and we'll read down to verse 10. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now I'm going to stop right there. Most people think sin is going out and murdering someone or cutting someone off in traffic or whatever. Sin is lawlessness. And you know what law... God gives to people, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Sin is not simply, I did something bad. Sin is, I have not given God everything, all of my affections, all of my heart. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is the violation of love to God first and secondarily to others. You know, verse 5, that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him, He's speaking of Christ, there is no sin. No one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen Him or known Him. Little children, and I will say to you, those listening to me, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, 
it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Christian, you are God's child now. But you were not always God's child. Jesus Christ looks at the non-believers and does not say we're all God's child. Jesus Christ looks at those who did not believe in Him and know Him and says you are of your father, the devil. But He says here, we are God's children now. Look at verse 9. What has changed? Why are we God's children now? No one born of God. God makes a practice of sinning. We have been born of God, Christian. That's why we are God's children. We've had a new birth and now are the children of a new father. Our will, which was once to do our other father, Satan's will, is now to do God's will. Our father, God. There's a power that dwells within us now that has changed us, that has changed us from the child of Satan to the child of God. Look there in verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. The seed of God now dwells, abides within the Christian. Now, this is basic, but it's absolutely critical to our understanding of the Christian life. We have some visitors here today. You've come to a Christian church, perhaps for the first time. Perhaps you're of a different faith. Perhaps you're agnostic. Perhaps you don't simply attend church, but you grew up maybe with the faith. I know a lot in Laredo have grown up very familiar with the Bible. And you say, what is Christianity? What is it at its core? Christianity is not a set of rules. Christianity is not some commandments put before us that we have to do, do, do. Christianity is the meeting of the living God, having God come stop you on your path to hell, meet you where you are, and transform you by removing your old heart, giving you a new heart, and as it says here, putting His seed within you. Literally, we will see putting His Spirit within you. The Spirit of God lives inside the Christian. This is not a set of commandments where you grit your teeth really hard and say, I want to do, 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 and now I'm a Christian because I go to church on Sunday. No, Christianity is knowing the living God and having Him live inside of you. Christianity the Christian life. There is a power that dwells within the Christian that makes it impossible for the Christian to continue living in a pattern of sin. I want to say that again. There is a power that dwells within the Christian that makes it impossible for the Christian to continue living in a pattern of sin. Did you hear me? impossible to continue habitually living in sin. Now, I have two qualifying statements for that statement. First, when John says it is impossible to continue in sin, he is not saying you become perfect. He is not saying that the Christian never sins at any time, ever, any time. What he's saying, well, that would contradict what he says earlier in the chapter. We won't turn there, but John says in 1 John 1 that if anyone says he's without sin, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. And he says, Christian, when you sin, confess your sins and God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So when he says it's impossible for you to continue in sin, he's not saying you're perfect. You never sin. But he is clearly stating that it is impossible for the Christian to continue unabated, unhindered in perpetual patterns of sin. The Christian cannot keep living enslaved to the same sin day after day after day after day. 
Let's get real for a moment. That lust in your heart that you describe as a chain that you cannot break, John says the Christian lives in victory over that perpetual sin. It will have no hold on you. Oh, you may struggle, men. You may struggle, ladies, with lust. You may fall here or there. James says we all stumble in many ways, but there is victory in the Christian life. You will not continue unabated, unhindered in that sin with a chain around you. Second qualifying statement, when John writes, he cannot keep on sinning, what is he saying? What is the nature of cannot here? So he's just said this, the Christian cannot keep on perpetually sinning. They're unable. It's an inability to keep sinning. Now, I want to look, and I'm I'm going to require your minds. The Lord says to worship Him in spirit and truth, to love Him with our heart and mind. And so I'm asking you to get your minds engaged here for the next few minutes. But we are going to look at two aspects of the Christian's inability to continue living in the practice of sin. First, There is, for the believer, the restraining and constraining power of overwhelming love for Jesus Christ. This is evidenced in the life of Joseph. If you remember, in Genesis 39, Joseph was serving in the house of Potiphar, the Egyptian leader, and his wife kept seducing Joseph day after day, or trying to seduce Joseph day after day for him to, to lie with her. And what does Joseph say? She at one point grabs his coat and says, lie with me, and he refuses. And listen to his words. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. For Joseph to sin, for Joseph to give in to his fleshly desires, would have been utterly contrary to the very operation of the love of God that dwelled within his new, regenerated heart. It would go against the very fibers of his spiritual being to do so. He's saying, look what God has done for me. How can I do this? To him and the Christian. Now, the Christian today, under fuller revelation of Jesus Christ, Joseph saw a promised Messiah, but he knew nothing in terms of what we know about Christ and what he's done. Christian, for you to see what Jesus Christ has done, God coming in the flesh, laying down his life for you, an enemy to him. And he's loved you, he's changed you, he's adopted you. He's poured out upon you riches of blessing. The Christian is constrained by an overwhelming love for Jesus Christ. It makes it impossible to continually, perpetually live in sin. Do you see it? Secondly, there is another constraining power in the Christian's life making them unable to continue living in habitual sin. And this is the constraining power of God Himself living inside of the Christian. You can turn with me to Ezekiel 36 if you'd like, or just follow along. Ezekiel 36, the new covenant promise God gives to His people. We are in the new covenant under Christ. And he says this, now listen to these words of God. Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 26. God saying to his people, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Who's doing the action here? You? God says, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. I will put my spirit within you. I am the actor. I am the one moving. This is an act of the living God to cause you to live a life of holiness. Do you see why Christianity is not a set of rules that we're constrained to keep in order to get to heaven? 
God says, I will put my spirit within you and I will move you to obey me. Christianity is the life of God in the soul of man. That's why we have such a statement as Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. That's the first part. Joseph saying, how could I do this sin against God? How could I do this wickedness against Jesus Christ? He says, work it out with fear and trembling. The fear of Joseph, I couldn't sin this way. You, as you look at the lust, as you look at the desire, as you look at the idolatry, as you look at the selfish gain, the the bitter rivalry, and you say, how could I do this with fear? God's done so much for me. I can't. I must turn away. But listen to the second verse in Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. The Christian has two powers at work within them. The power of the love of Christ constraining them to Christ and they have the love of Christ from God directed here constraining them with the Spirit of God living inside them. And so that's why John says in 3 John, whoever does good is from God. Something radical has happened to you. You've been born of a new nature, a spiritual God-given nature. You've been regenerated. Now, I want to spend a few minutes and look at the converse of that, the opposite of that. The, The opposite of this radical deep change in the nature of a Christian that makes it impossible for them to continue living in sin is not true of you if you are an unbeliever. Now, I want you to think about yourself. You cannot stop sinning. You cannot overcome the chains of that addiction, of that lust, of that disposition, of that action. For the unbeliever, this is not true of you. Look back at 3 John. Turn with me back to 3 John and verse 11. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Why is it that the non-Christian practice habitually evil? That your life is characterized by sin. Now think of your life. I'm not talking about diatrophies here. I'm not talking about the person out there. I'm talking about you. Think about your life. Is it characterized by sin? If it is, it's because your will is corrupted. And you have no desire to please God. Remember we saw Joseph in the face of a beautiful woman trying to seduce him. He said, how could I do that? I love God so much. But if your life is one characterized by sin, it's because first of all, you do not have a constraining love for this Christ. You may have a love for culture. You may have a love for the Jesus you grew up with and respecting church enough to dress up and come on a Sunday, but you have no constraining power of the love of Christ for what He's done for you personally by shedding His blood, absorbing the wrath of God for your wickedness. My friends, this is the difference between heaven and hell, life and death. Thus, we have a scenario that we're given in Luke chapter 14 when Jesus tells a parable and he says this, There was a great master and he had a banquet, he had a feast, and he had certain men that he was going to invite. Like today, we'll have a wedding celebration for Paula and for Joe. And we've invited many friends. They've invited many friends. Think of a feast and the invitations have gone out. Please join us and listen to what a response is given to the person inviting another man to the master's feast. He says, come, the table is ready. Come in to the, to the feast. Listen to what the man says. Don't turn there. This is Luke 14. I have married a wife. Therefore, I cannot come. I've got something better to do, so I can't go. I'm unable to go. There's an inability. I, I can't come to the feast because I don't want to come to the feast. If you look at your life, and it is a life characterized by sin, 
It's because you do not have a love of Christ constraining you. I've got to go to the feast. I've got to turn from this sin. You have a greater love constraining you, a love for self, a love for your own desires. This man could not come because he would not come. He had a constraining power of a morally corrupt will constraining him to choose his desires over the feast. And the unbeliever, you here this morning, if you are not trusting in Christ, you are constrained by the power of your own corrupted sinful will. But further, there is a second aspect of inability for the unbeliever, and it is this. We'll cover it very quickly. The inability of the unbeliever to come to Christ is the reality that the Spirit of God has not enabled them to come. John chapter 6 tells us, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. There are two components to the unbeliever's inability to obey, and there are two components to the believer's inability to live in perpetual disobedience. Now, I want to say... To any of you here who do not know Christ, Jesus Christ gives you one command today. Jesus Christ commands you this day, come to me. Turn from your sin. Turn away from your idolatry. Turn away from the lust of self. You realize the base root of sin. One person manifests by murder, Joe deals with men on the streets who are shooting, shooting places up and he has to arrest them and put them in jail and everybody looks at them and goes, Sinner! It's also manifested in the love you have for self, in your self-righteousness. Trying to show yourself better than your neighbor. Trying to show yourself more religious than the guy next to you. Trying to show yourself, I would never do such things as they. Trying to have the perfect outward testimony. And Jesus Christ looks at such self-righteousness and says, You whitewashed tomb. On the outside you're so pristine and clean. And on the inside you're full of dead men's bones. It's like cleaning the outside of the cup, but inside it's filthy and it's full of disgusting waste. You are like the one who cleans the outside and have bones inside. Whether you're a sinner out on the streets or whether you're a sinner secretly in your heart, if your life is characterized by a love of self, a love of lust, a love for your own idolatry, your own worship, your own praise, and not a radical, life-changing, life-transformating love of Jesus Christ constraining you to turn from evil, my friend, you do not know Christ. His promise is that I will come into your heart and I will change you. If you've not been changed, one of two things is real. Either God is a liar. He says, I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes. I'm going to cause you to be obedient and you're not being obedient. Is God a liar? Well, then the only other option is that you have not had the Spirit of the living, powerful God rip into your life and transform you and give you a new birth. John gives us a very basic lesson on regeneration. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Now let's return to our text Church, this is the reality of the Christian life. As you're turning to 3 John, the Christian life is not a new art or an acquired skill. Joe here and Elvia have been saved in recent months. We've seen a radical transformation in Joe. Many of you know, knew Joe just months ago. Perhaps some of you knew Elvia months ago and you've seen a radical change. What is this that this man has acquired? Is it a new skill? Has he said, you know what? This skill wasn't working for me. This hobby wasn't working for me. So I'm going to go and I'm going to try to be a Christian. So I'm going to go to this church and hear this preacher get up and preach on Sundays and I'm just going to try this new form. Not at all. The Christian life is becoming a new creation through the power of the Spirit of the living God. It is encountering the great almighty Yahweh, the great almighty I Am, who was and is and is to come. That is Christianity. And my friend, if this has not happened to you, then you are not 
a Christian, if you have not had an encounter with the living God of this universe that has changed you to the very core and fiber of your being, then you remain seated where you are, speeding toward damnation. My plea with you this morning, turn and live. Turn to Christ. Run to Him. And find life. John says it very simply. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Now knowing what we know about true conversion, we can read this sentence and feel its full weight. Those who persist in a sinful lifestyle sufficiently demonstrate that they are not born of God. Well, that's it. That's a basic lesson on regeneration. I have one more point. Thirdly, the place of reputation. Look there in verse 12. Of 3 John 1, Demetrius has received a good testimony. He's received a good testimony. Yet as I said at the start, we know so little about this man. You know, in Acts 19, we're told of another Demetrius. The only time that in Scripture we're told of Demetrius is here in Acts 19. In Acts 19, he was a maker of idols, and the Apostle Paul came through, and he incited riots to try to kill the Apostle Paul because people were becoming Christians and not buying his idols. Perhaps this is the same Demetrius. If it is, it's a glorious picture of redemption and salvation. I like to think that this is the same Demetrius, and he got saved, and now he's an example for the faith, but we don't know that. In fact, we know very little about this Demetrius. And yet, what a privilege that this man's life, of whom we know so little, lives on. This man's name will live on in Scripture and be remembered until Jesus Christ comes again. As what? Being a man worthy of imitation. Listen to Alexander McLaren talk about Demetrius. He says this, quote, A great many brilliant reputations might be glad to exchange a fame that has filled the world for a little epitaph like this. What he's saying is, men about whom books have been written would trade it all to have words like this written about them in Scripture from an apostle. He's received a good testimony. So let's look at what that means. First, it says, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone. We're going to see three points. From everyone, from the truth, and from the apostles. We'll cover these briefly. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone. Does this mean everyone in the church? Does this mean everyone out there? What does everyone mean? John doesn't give us much more insight than that. But let's assume it means everyone inside and outside the church, the world as well as the body of believers. There is something wrong if a Christian does not have a popular opinion in his favor from those out there and inside. What I mean is, a good reputation amongst people. If people would not testify positively about you, something is wrong. But of course, there is a sense in which nothing is more contemptible than to seek for that, a good reputation among men. Jesus said, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. So how do we reconcile this? Having a good reputation with everyone, being spoken of well by everyone, he says, But Jesus says, woe to you when spoken, when everyone speaks well of you. What is the balance that the Christian must strike when coming to have a reputation in the world? What is your testimony? What do people think about you in the world? On the one hand, to have a good reputation amongst men means to lead a life that has integrity of character. The world can detect a person of integrity and sniff out a hypocrite. Think of Jesus in John 8. What an example we have in Christ. You know, the world sniffs out the hypocritical Christian, the one in the headlines who says, I'm pious and religious, but then they're living a secret life. We see it often in the media, right? And the world sniffs it out and calls them out and loves to find those hypocrites. But the world also recognizes integrity. Jesus in John 8, 46 says, Which one of you convicts me of sin? Speaking to the sons of the devil, whom he's just said, he says, Who convicts me of sin? Can you speak ill of me? No one could. He was blameless amongst the world. Jesus had a good reputation. It's why those in the church, 
I said earlier, Paul says to imitate leaders in the church. It's why those in the church must be well thought of by outsiders. Because Christ was well thought of by outsiders. Jesus Christ had integrity. And it says here, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone. Demetrius was a man of integrity. But then what do we make of Christ's statement, woe to you when everyone speaks well of you? Is this a contradiction? No, and I I believe this is why. Consider Christ again for a moment. Jesus Christ had a reputation in this world that was unmarred, untainted by any sin. Perfect integrity. And yet he was despised, hated, and killed by the very same men. Why is that? Jesus said, the world hates me because I testify to it that its works are evil. The world hated Jesus not because he was a hypocrite who lacked integrity. The world hated Jesus because he was righteous and his life and his words exposed their evil. That is why the world hated Jesus. And Christian. That is why the world ought to hate you. Don't try this, I'm lazy at work, I never get my tasks done, my boss tells me to do something, I never really, I do it half complete, and look at me, I'm being persecuted because I'm a Christian. Well, because you're you're sharp tongue, you're impolite, you're arrogant. Christian, you are not to be hated by this world because you are self-centered and never show interest in other people. You are not to be hated in this world because you are self-righteous and make everyone around you feel condemned and like they're not good enough because you are the perfect pretty Christian. That's not why the world is to hate you. The world ought to hate you for one reason and one reason only. Because you testify that their works are evil. They hate Jesus for it and they'll hate His disciples. Somebody once said, guard your character and your reputation will take care of its health itself. Christian, you ought to be loved by those who should love you and hated by those who should hate you. Your responsibility to be like a Demetrius, to have a good reputation amongst all, is to focus on a godly character, loving the truth, walking with Christ, freeing yourself from weights and sins, And your reputation will take care of itself. You will find yourself loved by those who ought to love you. And you will find yourself despised by those who ought to despise you. Those who hate the righteousness and the Christ-likeness they see within you. You ought not to be clamoring for the reputation and fame of men. Oh, I just want everybody to like me. Jesus is saying, woe to you, you flatterer, when you're running around trying to please all men. Live a life of integrity, Christian. The world will see it. The world won't be able to speak evil of you, but they will hate you as they hated Christ. Secondly, Demetrius has a good testimony or reputation with the truth. Look there in verse 12. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. What does it mean that the truth testified to Demetrius? It means he had a consistent life with the truth. Now, here's the word of God. You are able to fool those around you. Husband, you can fool your wife. Wife, you can fool your husband. You can fool your neighbor. You can fool those around you to a certain extent. But listen to me, when your life is put up against the truth of God's word, it exposes and lays everything bare. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 2, you who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who preach against adultery, do you commit adultery? You're out here saying, look at that wicked man. Look at that wicked man cheating on his wife as you're living in an adulterous fantasy world of pornography and lust in your heart. And the truth exposes it. It says, are you real? You may be able to gain a good reputation with those about you. But do you have a good reputation with the truth of God's word? Demetrius did. The truth itself gives Demetrius a commendation, is what John says. Thirdly, he had a good reputation with the apostles, and this is the final point. It says there in verse 12, We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. Demetrius had a good reputation amongst the apostles of Christ. And here's the beautiful thing, Christian. 
the apostles of Christ are representatives of Christ. The apostles of Christ, they walked with Him. They saw Him with their own eyes. They touched Jesus. They heard with their own ears Jesus' words as He spoke and preached. These apostles saw Christ and testified about Him and proclaimed Him to the world. And it is these apostles that say of Demetrius, He is the real deal. What a beautiful commendation of this man. Imagine those who walked with Christ looking at you and saying, hey, imitate Him. That's what it said of Demetrius. But for Demetrius, this was not the highest commendation that this man would receive. It was only a precursor to the final commendation he would one day receive from his Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Church, this is the reputation that we desire to have. A testimony that speaks to men, that speaks to those out there, that you are a person of integrity. But church, You desire a reputation where one day, not just the apostles, not just your pastor, but where Jesus Christ Himself will look at you and say, well done, worthy of imitation, enter into the joy of your Master. Church, that is what we ought to strive to be. We know so little of this man. But I would give everything to have, like Alexander McLaren said, an epitaph like him where it's simply spoken, yes, this man is good. This man is worthy of imitation. Christian, follow him. Gaius, you exemplary, godly fellow worker for the truth, follow Demetrius. Look at him. Imitate that man. Well, the great Christian life is a life of imitation. To imitate God our Father, to imitate Jesus Christ His Son, and we have all these examples around us, Christian, let us be those who imitate what is worthy. These are simply helpful examples of those who have gone before us and have done exactly that, have followed Christ. May we follow in their steps, fixing our eyes on Christ. Father, please, May we run well. May we hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Master. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.